Hey everybody, welcome to Calum Science this weekend. I'm so privileged that you're here. If we haven't met before, my name is Chris and I'm the lead pastor here at the church. In 2014, we uh, went to Italy, my wife uh, and I, and our then six month old daughter. We spent three weeks traveling Italy and the Mediterranean. It was absolutely fantastic. We spent a bunch of that time in the city of Florence, Italy. Now, if you have a big anniversary coming up, if you really want to just blow all the expectations away, go to Florence. It is the most romantic city in the world. Now, I haven't been everywhere in the world, but I got to say, it's got to be the top five places. And so we spent some time there. Before we got there, uh, while we were still in Canada, somebody said, when you go, if you go, when you go to Florence, you have to try the Bistecca alla Fiorentina. This was a cut of steak that is famous from Florence, originated from Florence. And so when we were there, went to the hotel guest, uh, guest helper and said, hey, what restaurant should I go to? And they said, you go to this restaurant. So my wife and I went to this restaurant with our six-month-old daughter. It's one of those restaurants where you don't look at the right side of the menu because you really don't want to know how much you're spending on the food. But it was one of those times where we just said, you know what, we're just going to enjoy it. And so there it was, the Bisteca alla Fiorentina. Now, like I said, this steak has hundreds of years of history. It's from a particular type of cow. It's a particular cut. It's a particular width. It is prepared in a particular way. It has to stay at this temperature for two weeks. It has to be cooked under this open fire, under this particular type of wood. It has to have this olive oil, that salt, that pepper. It's very simple. And then it's prepared and brought in front of you. And it is and was the best thing I have ever ever tasted. My expectations were high, but they were absolutely blown away by what it actually was. And so uh, this is from my Instagram feed because I actually don't have a picture of it other than this. So this was on September 2nd, 2014 from my Instagram feed. It says my lunch today, 700 grams of Bisteca alla Fiorentina while hashtags were still cool. Hashtag meat sweats. Uh, it was absolutely phenomenal. The tenderness, it went above and beyond all of my expectations. My friends, we're starting a series this weekend called Beyond All. Beyond All. And we're thinking about what does it mean to be KAC? in the next three to five years of our history. So we're really looking at a text in Ephesians chapter three that talks about God and his ability to go beyond all we could ask or imagine. So this is in Ephesians chapter three, written by Paul to an ancient church. The first three chapters of this book is Paul mining the depth of doctrine and theology about what God has done in Jesus Christ and offering salvation for sinners like me. And at the end, of this section, he can't help but break out in what is called a doxology, a worship moment. And so at the end of this prayer in Ephesians chapter three, this is what Paul says, now to him, to God almighty, father, son, and spirit, the one who shares his life with us, who is able to do above and beyond all all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is from the uh, Christian Standard Bible version where he says above and beyond all all the same way that that steak, I mean, as little as it was, went beyond all, above and beyond all I could ever think. This is what we're, th we're asking God to do in our community. And so over the next five weeks, we're asking and answering this question. Who are we and where are we going? Now, everyone after COVID is asking that question. Who are we as an organization? Who are we as a people? Who are we as a family? Who are we as a couple? And so our church has been asking that question over the last four or five months intentionally. Who are we and where are we going? And this series, Beyond All, is answering that question, casting vision for the next three to five years of our church above and beyond all. This is what we are hoping and what we are praying. Henry Nouwen says this. Nouwen says in his book, Making All Things New, he says, the question is not simply, where does God lead me as an individual person who tries to do his will? That's an important question. But now it says more basic and oh, more significant is the question, where does God lead 
us as a people. In other words, it's not just my friends in an individualistic culture. It's not about you all the time. It's actually about the church. Where are we going? Us as a people. He goes on. This question requires that we pay careful attention to God's guidance in our life together and that together we search for a creative purpose. That's what this series is is us over the last four or five months saying, where are we going as a community of faith? Where are we going? What is our creative purpose? You see, every church, every New Testament church is trying to obey Jesus's great commission, make disciples, baptize, teach. Everyone's trying to do that. We do that in different ways. That's what we're asking and, and hopefully responding to through this series. What is our creative purpose? purpose above and beyond all. So here's what we're doing this weekend. We're going to just fly over our strategic plan, our strategic direction, where we are going. We're going to answer what is at the core of this? Who are we? Then what this is not, what this is, I just want to have some guiding introductory comments as we have this conversation, as we think to our future about really what we are doing and what we're not doing with this. And then finally, how you can join in. So what is our strategic plan? I want you to have this image embedded into your brain uh, as we continue this series and into our future. This is the Adam. You see, I was terrible at science and math. And so uh, the science and math people, uh, you understand this. I, I really don't. Uh, but this is the, uh, the KC Adam. And really what it does is it represents who we are. We are Christ-centered people. And what are we going to do? is these things. And so that's, this is at the core, that all of these initiatives, all of these strategic directions are, uh, are, are orbiting around the core of who we are and who we are. Uh, we are Christ-centered people. And that's what we're going to look at today as we launch this series, a reminder of who we are. We're Christ-centered. But then where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Formation, community, revival, missional engagement, and leadership development. Now, what I want to do is I just want to show you uh, some of our convictions around these uh, different ideas. So first, Christ Center. What does that mean? It means this. Our foundation is the purpose and work of Jesus. He is the nucleus of the KAC Adam around which every other strategic directive centers. To that end, every initiative, goal, and dream at KAC is designed to be carried out with Jesus, for Jesus, and because of Jesus. Who are we? Are Jesus people here at the church? Have always been, will always be. That is who we are. We're going to take a look at that in a few minutes. Now, out of that, out of this reality flows these directives or these directions. First one is formation. We desire to be continually formed into the image of Jesus for the sake of others. What is our future going to be full of? It's going to be full of formation, about practicing the faith, about going deep in Jesus, about theology and doctrine and teaching and all of these things to keep us grounded on who Jesus is. Also, what, what is our future going to be full of? Community, as a response to Christ's call to imitate, to intimate community with him and others, we desire to be a self-sacrificing and embracing community to all people. I heard a great story from our church over the Christmas break when one of our students from TRU who attends our church had nowhere to go for Christmas Day. And a family in our church said, hey, we got an extra spot at our table. Do you want to come and join us for Christmas Day? That, that is our future. A magnetic community, a loving, self-sacrificing. We're not just consuming community all the time for our sake. No, no, no. We're creating it for the sake of other people. This is going to be our future. So formation, community, revival. We desire and pray for a Christ-exalting, heart-reviving, sin-defeating encounter with the Holy Spirit that releases God's transforming power in our neighborhood, city, and world. And this has been kind of our mantra here as a, as a church since I got here for almost five years ago. We've been praying Habakkuk 3, Lord, we've heard of your fame. We stand in awe of your deeds. In our day, would you make them known? Renew them. Do it again is basically what Habakkuk is saying. God, in our day. So here's what we're doing. At KC, we're just coming and bringing the driest kindling we possibly can and stepping back and saying, Spirit of the living God, would you light it on fire? Would you do something in our day in a secular world, a renewal and a revival that happens in our hearts, in our church, in our city, and in our nation? So we're, what is our future going to be? 
feel like. It's full of revival, talk about revival initiatives, all of those sorts of things. Then missional engagement. We believe that every follower of Jesus is called to be on mission everywhere all the time by boldly proclaiming and demonstrating the love of Jesus to others. So every single, pre- every single person in our church, those who are in the retirement residence, senior retirement residence, and those who are in elementary school, every single person in their sphere of influence on mission all the time. Hey, can I buy you a coffee? Demonstrating the love of God. And hey, can I bring you to Alpha? Proclaiming, proclaiming, inviting people to church to come and experience the presence of Jesus here. Missional engagement to go out into our community, to bring the glory of God outside of our church, to do things like the emergency weather shelter that we have. We're doing that. To go to Arthur Hatton School and to read to kids there. My friends, that's who we're going to be over the next season of our church, missional engagement. And finally, leadership development. We seek to follow Christ's commission to identify, train, and equip leaders at all levels to make Jesus known in our church, neighborhood, city, and our world. And so that's true of you. It's true of me. So, so often in our church tradition, the weight of leadership and preaching always falls on paid staff. That cannot happen anymore. Yes, of course, we are glad to serve you. We understand our role, but our role is to equip the saints for works of service from Ephesians chapter four. So we have initiatives, thoughts, prayers, dreams to help develop you for mission, for service, both in our church, in your business, in your family, and in our world. And so that is the KAC Adam, my friends. We are Christ-centered people focusing on formation, community, revival, missional engagement, and leadership development. And so this, ser- this series, over the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at each week formation, and then next week formation, then the week after that community, all the way through as we unveil and pray towards beyond all exceedingly, abundantly more than all that we could ask or imagine. This is what uh, we're praying for and hoping for. So this week, we want to start with the question of what is at the core? Who are we? Who are we? What we're going to do is we're just going to go above where we just read. Paul's doxology is now to him who is able to do more above and beyond all we could ask or think according to his good pleasure, according to his power at work within us. What he does actually is he just, that's a continuation of a prayer. So it, before he prays that doxology, he says this in Ephesians chapter three, verses 14. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the father. What you need to see is that Paul is posturing himself physically in his prayer before God. He is submitted to him in humility before the father. This is a Trinitarian prayer. The scope is the Trinity, the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. What he's talking about here is identity identity. Who are we? We are the named people of God that out of the father's initiating action, all of creation has come into being that all things derive from his life, that he is the unmoved mover. He is the one who has given and shared his life because of who he is. This is the father. Then Paul continues to pray. I pray that he, the father, may grant you, he's going to bestow, he's going to give you, what What is he going to give you? First of all, according to the riches of his glory, out of the father's storehouses of of him being God, he's going to come and he's going to bring you, he's going to give you. So it's one thing if a multi, multi, multi billionaire comes and he gives you $5. It's like, that's great. It's another thing. If that multi, 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 multi billionaire comes to you and says, all that I have is yours. I'm going to give all of it to you. You have access to it. And that's what, that's what Paul is praying. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being. How? Through his spirit. This is a trinity in action. The initiating love and power of the father. 
the strengthening work of the spirit that the spirit is gonna bring the presence and the power and the glory of God into your everyday existence as you're parenting and working and cooking and loving and leading, that this is, can, can be your reality. He says, I pray he may grant us, our, the church, according to the riches of it, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. You have the initiating action of the Father. You have the strengthening work of the Spirit. And how does this all come together? And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The initiating action of the Father, the Spirit bringing the strength to you, and Jesus is at the core of our lives. He is at the center the initiating action of the Father, the strengthening work of the Spirit, and the indwelling presence of Jesus in your life at the center of it all. What does it mean that Christ would dwell in your heart? To dwell means that he takes up permanent residence. 24-7, winter, spring, summer, fall at your bachelor party, on Christmas Eve, during tax season, during your suffering, that Christ dwells, he takes up residence permanently in your life. We all know the feeling of our couch. I actually call it my perch. My couch situated in front of my fireplace Next to the light, I have a nice place where I can rest my arm or a snack. The TV is right there so I can watch my Seahawks lose or the Canucks lose or the Blazers win. All of it's right there. This is my home. I feel at home there. I dwell there. It's my perch. This is what what Paul is praying, that, that Jesus would feel at home in your life. Three particular ways. The first way that he would feel at home is in your reason. This is about wisdom. It's about wisdom. This is how you view your life. Are you a Christ-centered person in the way that you view all of your life? From the way that you spend your money to the way that you recreate to the way that you consume food to the way that you do your taxes to the way that you look and, and schedule your time to the way that you spend your money. Do you look at all of these things through a Christ-centered lens? Is he at home in every one of those areas? The second thing is that he would be at home in your conscience. This is about sensitivity. Are you a Christ-centered person in the way that you are sensitive to the things of God? Here's, Here's a litmus test. Do you have active rhythms of confession and repentance in your life. Because if you don't, if you can't remember the last time you sat down with somebody else or in front of Jesus and said, Here, here's, the, here's the places that you are not at home in my life, that you are becoming more and more hardened and jaded to the things of Jesus, then you are sensitive. Are you a Christ-centered person in the way that you view things, in the way that you partake of information, is it becoming, are you becoming more sensitive to the things of Jesus Christ or not? Is he dwelling in those, in your conscience? And then finally, will. Is he at home? This is about action in your life. Like if somebody was to follow you around and see the way that you live, you talk, you, you go about your life, would they see that, that, that you're a Christ-centered person? To, for Jesus to be at home in the way that you view your life, in your emotional world and the things that you're sensitive to, and the way that you live your life, is Christ at home there? Would you be and would you consider yourself a Christ-centered person? Every one of us, even if you're like not a Christian, you wouldn't consider yourself Christian at all. Every single one of us has something at the center of our lives. That our, we orbit around something. It, 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 it could be worry. We're just worried all the time. You, you, your life orbits around that. 
It could be money. Do I have enough? I have too much. What do I do with it? It, it, You're orbiting around money. Maybe it's just lust. You just want more for your own benefit. And your life orbits around this addiction. Something is at the center of your life. Who are we going to be? We are Christ-centered people. That our church, our lives, our thoughts, our money, our, our sexuality, everything orbits around Jesus. Who are we? We are Christ-centered people. And so this weekend is a call to Christ-centeredness again. It's a call for your business that you run, that you employ people. Is it a Christ-centered business where the ethics, the ministry of Jesus is presented? Yeah, bottom line, of course, you got to be profitable. But the way that you treat your people, is it Christ-centered? You as an employee, as you go out in your workplace, do you work hard? Do you cut corners? Are you a Christ-centered employee? Your home, the things that are said and modeled, the things on your screens, is it a Christ-centered home? Your marriage, is it a Christ-centered marriage? When is the last time you prayed, talked, turned the screen off and talked about Jesus and what he's doing in your life? Your key relationships, are they Christ-centered or are they only based on shallow activities? Like when you're hunting with your buddies, is it only about what you're trying to hunt or is it actually sharing, hey, here's what I'm thinking about my future and here's what I'm worried about. Is it a Christ-centered relationship? You're parenting. We need a call back to being a Christ-centered, worry-free, patient, loving parenthood present to them. Man, I need that. The way that you recreate, is it Christ-centered or is it just all about your comfort? My friends, if, if your whole life is only geared for your ease, your comfort, and your control, may I suggest to you that your version of Christianity has nothing to do with the Bible has nothing to do with the ministry of Jesus and the commission he has on your life to be on mission. This is a call for our church to be Christ-centered, that we exist to know Jesus and to make him known. I've said this all the time. We don't exist. Our church does not exist to fill your calendar. Our church doesn't exist to check off all of your personal preferences. Our church exists to know Jesus and to make him known. And so this is this weekend. Who are we going to be, my friends? We are Christ-centered people. Now, I want to make some comments about this strategic plan that I think will guide the next season, the next series, of uh, the next weeks of this series uh, as we go through it. Because th- there's some ickiness that can come up as we talk about the strategic plan. So these are some guiding comments. So if you hear people like, ah, oh, they're grr, they should go listen to Pastor Chris talk about kind of to properly situate this conversation and this series, okay? So uh, let, me, let me talk to you about what this is not. What this strategic plan, the strategic direction, what it's not. Number one, this is not my vision for the church, Okay. I get who I am. I get, I have influence in our church. I understand all of that, but we lead here with a plurality of leaders. So the one model is that one leader goes up to Mount Sinai or goes up for a retreat, right? And they hear from the Lord directly. And then that leader comes back down and says to everybody, thus saith the Lord or thus saith lead pastor, everybody go do what I want you to do. That's one way that this happens. Let me tell you, that's not how this came to be. This is not just about me. Do I own it? Yeah, I love it. Yes, 100%. But this is not just me. So let me just briefly tell you about the process of how we came up with all this. It started in September of 2022. We had 50 to 60 representatives of our church, okay? Old, young, people who have been here for 100 years, not that long, but a long time, people who are new to our church, people who have seen the best, seen the worst, they were all there. And for dozen, a dozen hours or so, Friday night, all day Saturday, we brought in somebody to facilitate this process. We looked at the history of our church, the good, the bad, the ugly. 
We looked at some things that, w- that were really shaping in the history of our church. We looked at the legacy, the spiritual legacy of our church. And then we started to say, now what's rising to the surface of, as far as our future? What are the five things that rise to the So we, we did that, all right? We heard from the people, you, about our church, representing our church. We couldn't hear from everybody, but we did that. Then for dozens and dozens of hours from basically October all the way to the middle of December, we had many, many eyes on it. Men, women, older, young, staff, elders, senior management team, lead team, all these people. We, we dug through it. We cut. No, we don't like this. We got to throw away that. What about that? This was a long process. This is not just my vision. This is something that we as a senior leadership staff and elders own. We actually passed it as a motion. And our elders meeting in December. This is not just me. This is owned by all of us hearing from you and also doing the work. So that's what this isn't. What this isn't is the only mark of a healthy church. There's stuff in here that, are, that is not represented. Okay. There's stuff in here uh, that is not mentioned. There's maybe some things that you're passionate about. This is what we know is that this is not the only mark of a healthy church. There's lots of things that need to go on that is not represented here. What I'm telling you is yes, It's imperfect. We get it. We know it. But as we're going to talk about, it's about stewardship. What this isn't, it's not an ambitious plan to make KAC great. That's what this is not. As Paul prayed in his doxology, to him be glory in the church. To him be glory in the church. Not glory to me or our staff or you, but to Jesus. One day, this church will no longer be. We've been here for 75 plus years. One day, this church will close its doors. Whether it's because the second coming of Christ has happened, praise God, or whether some some different season happens in our culture, in in our city, we close, Kamloops Alliance Church will cease to exist one day. We're okay with that. Because all of this is about him. To him be glory in the church. Attached to every strategic direction, formation, missional engagement, attached to every one of these, as we're going to see, are faith goals. Numerical goals. So for instance, we have a number of people we desire to see graduate from our pastoral apprentice program that we are going to launch because of the strategic plan. There's a number attached. There's, they're full of numbers. And some people, ooh, when, when, when the church starts to talk about numbers, they bristle. Because it's like, who are you? You know, you're so proud. You're so ambitious. You're getting ahead of God. You're telling God what to do. Uh, we, we, I get it. I totally get it. Some, my personality, I like it. It's goal setting. Other people are like, oh, I don't like that. It, we, we have acknowledged that from the beginning. Our church is not about numbers, okay? That's not what this is. It's not this ambitious plan to make our name great so that we can go, no, 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 no. We don't just care about these are representative of people and they are faith-filled prayers. We're going to get into that in a second. This is not an ambitious plan to make KC great. Here's what it is. It's re- uh, It's not that Uh, I screwed up the order of this. And so uh, this is what this is not. Okay. So uh, this is what this is not. We are not replacing sound doctrine for missional effectiveness. Quickly. We are not giving up the Bible in order to be missionally effective. We are Christ centered people attached to the Bible and we will always be that Those people. In fact, it's because we hold on to the Bible that I believe we can be missionally effective. And so now let me get in the proper order what this is. Here's what this is it's solidifying values and trajectory. That's what our strategic plan is. It's saying, here's the direction we're going. This is about stewardship. I feel the responsibility in our community of our people, of you, of the resources, of our building. I feel the responsibility of all of it. And this is about stewardship. How do we make 
the greatest impact for God in this time. I believe that I will answer to Jesus for my leadership here at KC and our staff feel it as well. And so this is about solidifying values and trajectory. Here is the the trajectory of where our church is going. What, What is this? This is our unique contribution to our church and the city for the next season. This is our unique contribution. As I said, every church in our city has a unique contribution. We bless them. We love them. We say, go for it. But here at KC, here is what we feel God is asking to do, us, asking us to do. Now, there are going to be people as we go through the next five weeks who say, well, what about... What about my pet passion? What about my pet ministry? What about, it's not, it's not talked about. Does that mean it doesn't happen? That doesn't necessarily mean that. But we feel there are so many great things to do. There's so many opportunities. We have to narrow it. We have to have a laser focus in order to see impact. So think about this strategic plan like this. Uh, it's, it's the blueprint of a new house. And so the KC house, we've been living in this house for a long time. We have our ministries and our stuff going on. But the strategic plan is a blueprint for a new house. And so as we've been living in this house, doing the ministry, doing this stuff, it's been great. We've been planning and dreaming about a new house. And if you've ever done this before, you know exactly the process. What color are the walls? What are the dimensions? How many floors? Do, are they, is it in-floor heating? Is it whatever? This is the strategic plan that we've been talking about. And now our church is moving from the house that we lived in into this new house. Over the next season, it's not going to be drastic, but we're going to feel the change from the old house to the new house. And I know church people love change, so we're not going to have any problems. Um, If you've ever moved, you, you know that when you get to the new house, you realize, oh man, the couch that we had doesn't actually fit in our living room. We have to leave that old couch for this new one. And the painting that really matched the color of the walls in our old house doesn't match anymore. What do we do? My friends, this is going to be us. There will be some changes ahead. There has to be. We can't live in both houses. As we all know, you can't afford two mortgage payments, right? We have to move into, and it will, it will communicate. We're going to lead well. We're going to do change management well, but it has to change because of this or else what was the point of this entire strategic plan? Then a prayer filled hope for what Casey could grow into. My friends, I get it. Some people don't like numbers. They bristle at it. Ugh, I, I totally understand. We get it. Here's what this is supposed to do. It's supposed to initiate, ignite a holy imagination. What could happen beyond all? So if, if, you, if you don't like some of the ways that we, what I invite you into is a prayer filled, holy imagination. What could happen in your life, in our church, in our city, in our nation, and in our world? It demands humility. This isn't about us. This is about Jesus coming in and doing things that we can't, we can't even comprehend. Okay, so now how can you join? How you can join in? First thing is to pray. I'm inviting you to set an alarm on your device, on your phone, on your watch, every single day at 314. Why? Because this is the prayer, right? This is the prayer. So every day, set, set your alarm and pray. Give, my friends, this vision is audacious. It's audacious. We, we need you to give of your time, your talent, and your treasure. We need you to be involved. Like, if this just is just me sweating and spitting and talking up here, nothing will change. But you got to give, you, you got to invest here. So pray, give, and go. I'm inviting you to dream big and start small. Dream big, start small. Start small. Go, be people of action. Go, do something. Invite someone to Alpha. We need you to go 
and be brave with your neighbors. Invite someone to Alpha. We need you to start to serve again. It's been a long time. Pandemic really messed up your routines. You haven't really come back to church. You kind of like the comfort. We need that to stop. We need you here. We need you to invest. We need you to take care of the kids at KC Kids. We need you to help in the tech booth. We need you to help around here. We need you involved, not just passively consuming online church. We need you here. Now, if you're not in Calumps, we love you. We bless you. But we need you here to help us. Go to our serve form on our website. Okay. So... This past summer, I was uh, at our general assembly, which is the highest kind of uh, gathering of our denomination. It happens every two years. And I was sitting at Sherwood Park Alliance Church. Sherwood Park Alliance Church was where my grandfather was actually a pastor. If you don't know, I'm actually a third generation pastor in our denomination. There's a lot of story there, but I was sitting at Sherwood Park Alliance Church and I was texting with my dad about my grandpa's time at Sherwood Park Alliance Church. It's just unbelievable what he did and the legacy and the work and what God did through that time and his leadership at Sherwood Park Alliance. So a few few weeks ago, my dad sent me an email from somebody who attended Sherwood Park Alliance in the 80s, okay? And this person took notes from one of my grandfather's sermons at Sherwood Park Alliance that was a vision message about where the church was going. And my dad got a hold of these sermon notes and sent them to me. And so I, w- I want to show you these sermon notes. They're, it's a little old school, but this was in February 24th, 1980. Okay. This was the vision of my grandfather of, of Sherwood Park Alliance Church. Here, here's the vision. Number one, double the congregation in three years to 1600 people. Number two, retire their debt in five years. They had just built this beautiful building. Number three, establish school with at least 500 students in three years. Number four, establish the church as a research learning center. Number five, more programs and activities which are Bible centered. Number six, more young people in the church, more committed to Christ, more young people uh, following in baptism, membership, and Bible school. Number seven, more staff to complete the ministry. Number eight, I love this, printing press. It's the 80s, 1980. This was the dream. This was the hope. At the end, it says each, my grandpa said, each one of you should pray, Lord, give me a ministry to love others to you. Man, would that be your prayer? Give me a ministry to love others to you. And here's the verse that was anchored this whole vision. Ephesians 3, 20. He is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. It's the same vision. And at the end, it's Second Chronicles, be strong, therefore, and let not your hearts be weak. Man, what I'm, the point of this is not about my family. The point of this is that the Alliance in Canada, our family of churches, have always been these types of people. Beyond all. Beyond all. One of the things my grandpa wanted was to establish a school with at least 500 students in three years. This is what is now Strathcona Christian Academy. It's an elementary school and a high school that serves hundreds and hundreds of students. That vision was birthed in 1980, and now it's happening. And that is what we are praying for here, that we would be at the genesis of these types of moves of God, that we would be the type of people that would lean in and say, yes. I love that in Ephesians 3, it says, beyond all you can ask. And as a parent, I get asked silly questions. Like the other day, it was my daughter's birthday. And the question was for one of my kids, daddy, can we have birthday cake for breakfast? I'm like, no, that's a silly question. That's an audacious question. Why would you even ask me that? Here's what Paul is saying. Beyond all we can ask. We're asking We're asking Jesus to renew our hearts, to send revival. And it is not a silly question because he can do above and beyond all. And may it be so for his glory in our time. So Jesus, come, humble us. Humble us. Who are we?
Lord, as we steward ourselves and this time and our resources, our families, we lay it in front of you, Lord, and we, we want to be Christ-centered people, that you are at the core, that our whole church lives, being families, revolve around you, that you are at the center. So come, Holy Spirit, and do what we cannot do. For the sake and the glory of Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week as we tackle formation. Bye-bye.